Good morning, friends. Good to be with you today. Palm Sunday, wow, um, signals the end of the six weeks of Lent that have come since the cold end of winter, and now it's spring, and we have Holy Week ahead of us. Palm Sunday, the one on whom our hopes are pinned clip-clops into the great east gate of Jerusalem. On reflection, this looks very much like a trap, baited and cocked, as if Jesus were a mouse actively nosing into one of those bait boxes that are spring-loaded and which will turn out to be a sudden end. Oh, Jesus, do you know what you're doing? Do you know what or who awaits you here? There's trouble lurking in these neighborhoods and meeting rooms and temple courts. The enemy has his eye on you. You could take your inserts and set them aside. We will not be using those sheets for the rest of our worship hour. The path of worship for today will be familiar old service of the word on page 38 in your red book. We're going to sing three hymns today, and the last, the last two are hymns that are only sung on this day. They are Palm Sunday hymns, and they don't find a place ever again in the whole year. So when we get to... The, the second and the third hymn, um, get your singing out because it's your one shot for the year. We'll begin with hymn 373. of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. 
We've come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we've disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sin by the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord, Jesus Christ. He has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Father, you sent your Son to become a human being like us and to suffer death for our sins. Help us to be humble as he was humble, to endure as he endured, and then grant us to share in the triumph of the resurrection as he did. We ask this for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please. Two scripture readings today. We put the Old Testament reading second today in the hopes that hearing the splashy, dramatic Palm Sunday reading first, that then that will illuminate um, what was being said before Jesus ever arrived here on earth. So we're reading from the Good News According to Luke today. This is chapter 19. And if you're reading along, it's page 1320. The Palm Sunday entrance of Jesus is one of the times that all four books that open the New Testament write about it. And that doesn't happen as frequently as you'd think, that all four of those authors with four different audiences uh, record the same. We, we had an example a week or two ago where Luke uh, wrote the prodigal son. Nobody else has that story. That's just in Luke 15. This is one of the episodes where everybody's got it and the details from one uh, blend into our understanding of this story. I think you're going to be surprised by at least one thing about this reading. Luke would not have been there. Luke uh, prefaces his book by saying, I was not among the first generation Christians and I had to do first person research. I had to talk to people who were there. Um, so he's writing something down uh, which he did not witness with his eyes, where the other ones, of course, John was there and Matthew was there and um, Mark is thought to be the penman for Peter, the Apostle Peter. So um, 
I think there's something in here which uh, maybe upon reflection you're going to say, hey, where was that? And we'll, we'll mention it later. This is Luke 19. Uh, Jesus has been speaking a parable. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying that colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. This is the word of the Lord for you. We respond with the psalm for today, which is number 24. It's in your hymn book on page 73. We'll listen to the refrain and the psalm tone. Maybe today we could, uh, because this is sort of a responsive psalm, maybe we could sing it with the two sides of the worship room um, alternating lines. How about if we had this side sing the first line and this side sing the second?
Okay, that second scripture reading comes from before Jesus was born among us. It's Isaiah 42. If you're reading along, page 901. Little note in your bulletin. <clears throat> so here we hear about the servant. Quote, this figure from the songs of Isaiah who walks so constantly through the Gospels. His mouth and his hands, think of that, they're going to be mentioned, his mouth and his hands. Bring to mind the humble donkey rider. And then three times there's a word used which probably doesn't communicate very well to us. When we hear the word justice, we think of, you know, a, the courts um, and we, this elusive, abstract idea of justice. But here, it is the, the message of the servant. So what message did Jesus bring that sprang out of God's court? It is the verdict of righteous or not guilty for the sinner who puts her trust in God's lamb. So you're gonna hear that justice three times. Think of verdict, verdict. Here we go. Isaiah 42, verse one. Here's my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. Think of Palm Sunday. A bruised reed, this is you, he will not break. A smoldering wick, he will not snuff out. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his Torah, in his instruction, his teaching, the, nation, the, the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says, he who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth, and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life <clears throat> to those who walk on it. <clears throat> Speaking to the servant here. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. This is my program. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. This is the word of the Lord for you. We respond, praise be to you, O Christ, Okay, here comes one of the Palm Sunday hymns. You only get one shot at this every year. Let's stand for 133.
all of Lent, my friends, has been angling toward this moment. Um, think of a funnel. <clears throat> People funneling into the walled city of Jerusalem. I put a little graphic in your service folder. Maybe you didn't even know what that was a graphic of. I had to look at it twice myself. Um, people funneling into Jerusalem, a walled city, coming in from the big east gate. Um, you know, Jerusalem was a city, we think of it as this grand cosmopolitan capital. What are the big capitals of the world when you think of it? Um, you know, for years it was, it was Berlin and London and Paris and Moscow. Now you'd probably add a couple more in the Far East. Jerusalem only had 50,000 people. But Passover time, 500,000. Think about it. It was a walled city. Why did you have a wall around a city? Omaha doesn't have a wall around it. Ralston doesn't have a wall around it. Because every day at sundown, you closed her up. Boom! So people couldn't come and take your stuff. And at sunrise, the gates opened up. So in a big city, you of course, would try to have a gate at each point of the compass. Sometimes geography um, factored into that. If you were one part of the city or another part of the city was closer to water or closer to the saltwater uh, vendors of fish, you know, you'd have a special gate heading out that road. 500,000 people crammed into Jerusalem. The pilgrims, Jewish people, Jewish believers from all over the world, it was required that you come. And you couldn't say it doesn't work, we have a scheduling conflict. You couldn't do it. It was required of you. The three big festivals were called pilgrim festivals or travel festivals, and this is Passover. 500,000 people. Every empty lot had a fire going, tents up, canopies, tarps, music playing, different dialects, stores opening early and staying open late. The temple, the temple, the temple the epicenter of activity and interest. If you had lived in Jerusalem, you wouldn't have had a choice in this. If you have an empty room in your house, you had to open it up for guests. And it was considered a badge of honor to host people who came from Africa or from towards Europe or Asia. You had guests whom you did not know and did not invite. But you had room, you put a little card out or a sign out. Um, and you would have people to meet and stories to hear and food to serve and cleaning to do. And it was all festive. Passover. Really, if you follow me, it was their Independence Day because Passover was the night that God broke his people out of slavery and they became free people for the first time in 430 years in Egypt. You know the Passover story. We're not going to talk about it now. We'll talk about it on Thursday night. But in general, in general, you know Passover involved a lamb. Ultimately, that lamb would wind up on the table for the meal. But before that, you know some pretty impressive, dramatic, and a little bit alarming things happened with that lamb. Every family the Lord said to Moses, every family picks a lamb. And you have that lamb with you. I mean, who, who got this in the, reading this in Exodus 12 in the Old Testament? You have that lamb with you for four days. 
before its life got interesting. You have that lamb with you for four days, and then on sundown, on the Passover day, the family would gather in the backyard with that lamb. Now, think of this. Palm Sunday is a Sunday. In other words, it is a little Easter. It is not part of Lent, believe it or not, according to the thinking that Lent is the somber time of intense personal introspection where we find nothing in our hands to bring to God and are therefore absolutely ready to receive from him. But Palm Sunday is a Sunday. It's a, it's a, it's a, a joyful day and many a congregation on this day will purchase palms and have a procession into the worship room uh, singing to build up the, the suspense and the joy of the day. It is not, it does not have the Lenten tone that comes in on us like a big surf um, as soon as we leave here today and Holy Week stretches out in front of us with the Last Supper and Jesus' arrest and the trial before church and state and the hill outside of the city gate called Calvary. And the Saturday, nobody knows what to name it because that was the day Jesus lay in the grave and put some traction under his promise, I will be with you always. Did you think I was just going to be with you while you were sucking air? No, I am with you always, even when you go in your grave. I've been there first, and I broke open the way. So Saturday, sometimes people call it Holy Saturday, this is what the creed is talking about after a while when you say, crucified, died, and buried. He is one of us. But Palm Sunday stands at the head of the week, and it's like a gate. It's like a gate. If you read the Palm Sunday episodes in the different writers, as I said before, the different writers had different audiences. And sometimes that's kind of hard for us because we just think it's all scripture and uh, the Holy Spirit is trying to pour this down uh, our ears and it's all to the same audience. But it wasn't originally written all for the same audience. When John writes, he prefaces the Palm Sunday episode with something kind of interesting. There was a dinner given at somebody's house whom you know in a little village called Beth, Beth Ani. Mary and Martha lived there. And they were having a party what kind of party would you call this? To celebrate their brother being brought out of the cemetery. And we get to hear some conversation spoken by the church leaders in Jerusalem because they knew about this raising from the dead. And they said, we are getting nowhere trying to stamp out this Jesus thing. In fact, it's getting worse. Now he hauls some guy out of his cemetery plot, and more people than ever are becoming believers and followers of Jesus, and they said, Lazarus has to die too. Lazarus has to die again. You know, it, it, when you read it, you think to yourself, nowadays, you would just ruin him on social media. <laughs> Lazarus. 
Or if you were a mobster and mafioso, you would say, um, we're going to go break the plate glass windows in your nice business to teach you a lesson. Or maybe we'll stop and have a chat with your little girl on the way home from school. But no, they came to the conclusion, Lazarus has to die. Isn't that amazing? That, uh, I mean, for a bunch of reasons, the, the, the brightest and best, the leaders of the church said, this guy must disappear off the streets because he's, his story is bringing people to Jesus. So now they had two guys, their, their top two most wanted were Lazarus and Jesus. And then John slides into the Palm Sunday story because geographically Bethany was at the top of the Mount of Olives. Now don't think of the, a mountain like you used to draw mountains in third grade with crayons on a piece of paper. That's not the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is a ridge, a long ridge with no specific high spot. It's a, it's a high ridge to the east of Jerusalem running north and south. So when you come to the brow of the Mount of Olives, you're heading west. The Mediterranean Sea is 60 miles to the west. You come to the brow of the Mount of Olives, you have a descent. It goes down through a park where big, weedy looking olive trees, it's not like a nice peach orchard in, um, in, 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 that you've driven by or an apple orchard. It's not that kind of a, the garden, the, um, the Mount of Olives. It's these enormous broken down stumpy olive trees which put out new shoots and create little groves here and there. And Jesus met there many times with his disciples. And you do get a picture of the city lying below you and you would clearly see the temple platform as I'm looking at the city of Jerusalem. The enorm you had to go up, up, up to get just to the platform that the temple was built on. So. There's kind of your, your setting. Jesus had most recently been in Jericho, which was 17 miles down, 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 the other direction to the east, it drops down to the Jordan River and has 17 miles of switchbacks. That's the Good Samaritan story. Great places for robbers to hang out and you don't really have a way to protect yourself. So, If you want to make the people in Jerusalem nervous on Passover, how about having a little parade where somebody is making noises about being royalty? You know, the, 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 the walls of Jerusalem, it's not like a picket fence, like a wooden stockade. It's a big double wall filled in with rubble in between, and there's a road up on top and apartments in the wall and on top of it. I remember walking with a buddy um, up to get up to the, to, to the top of the walls um, and these long, long stretch of steps. I, I'm just going to take a wild guess and say, 60 yards of steps um, sloping up away from me. I remember this a little old granny dressed in black with a black babushka and she had a five gallon um, water tank. Um, she was carrying water obviously up to her lodge and she was on each step lifting this thing and going up and we, we came by her and although she spoke a different language than we did, we smiled and said hi and pointed to it and said and, and she smiled and we carried her water up for us. So you get up on top of the wall and you had a soldier's view of the countryside and you got to know that the cops were up there, the Roman soldiers were up there, 500,000 people packed into this city, these difficult to rule people even in the best moments they were unruly 
And now it's Independence Day, and it's just a powder keg. You know, what would, what would happen if you drove down I-29 through Iowa and you cross into Missouri where they got the fireworks factory? What is it, Black Cat? What is that big? What if you walked in there um, pulling a, a, a lighted Weber grill behind you? Um, th that's what the, what the atmosphere was. Anything goes wrong we have Bedlam. And so Pontius Pilate is here. He normally is not in Jerusalem. His palace is in Caesarea, 60 miles away on the Med Sea. And his beautiful theaters and racetracks and palaces. And lovely, lovely, lovely in Caesarea. Now he's in Jerusalem. You can bet he's got a headache. You want to make him nervous? How about having a little parade where people are singing, God's king approaches. Waving, spring, garlands. Yeah, but the palm branch, strangely, we don't see this, but the coins of that time, silver dollar-sized coins of the Caesars of Rome, have palm branches around their heads. There's something to do with royalty or kingship with the palm branches. They're waving palm branches. Jesus is riding, albeit on a little colt. It's never been ridden before, so it is not a heroic picture. It's meant to have people go, oh, I was hoping for. Jesus is mounted. He comes toward the city. The people, he's going down the Mount of Olives. And then he's going to have to come up the other side, up the other side of the ravine, into the city. And people are singing, Blessed is he who comes in the name of our father David, who's been dead a thousand years, but he was the great beloved soldier king of Israel. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Our king is coming. What do you think the communications and the intel on the wall and at the gates was sending fast and furious to the decision makers? It seems from time to time that Jesus even, I won't say egged his followers on, but they knew something was going to happen now. And what did they think it was? They thought Jesus was going to set up his, his own throne and he was going to rule the nations from Jerusalem. So everything is amped up to the highest possible excitement and anxiety. Funneling into Jerusalem. Now, here's one for you. Remember I said before that the Lord told Moses that the people in Egypt were to select a lamb four days before that's Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the lamb selection day. God is selecting his lamb for a slaughter at the Passover. What a dramatic moment. To us, we started our worship saying, it looks a little bit as if Jesus were a mouse actively nosing into one of those bait boxes that are spring-loaded and which will turn out to be a sudden end. Jesus, do you know what you're doing? You can't get out. I remember when Liz and I lived in Colorado, we liked to go up to the mountain towns that didn't have skiing. 
because you would not have the crowds uh, in summertime. And as we made our way uh, at, at our opportunities to, to travel up to different old, um, old, they had a name for it, and it escapes me at the moment, the, the towns that had 100 or 150 year old sections still standing. Um, we went to Telluride one time. You know the name Telluride. Now it's the name of a vehicle. But Telluride is, is remarkable because when you go into Telluride, you have to come out the same way because it's a box canyon. You know what that, you know what that is? So you can't go into it and drive through it and go out another way. You have to turn around and come back out the way you went in because as you go into Telluride, the mountain range rises up to an enormous height and you're blocked in and the only way out of Telluride is to go back the way you came. Well, when Jesus went into Jerusalem, it was like that. He wasn't coming out uh, again, was he? he? This is where, this was dying time now and he knew it, but nobody else knew it. But the Lord God selected his lamb, the lamb, the one lamb that all the other lambs pointed to, the one lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And today we rejoice on Palm Sunday. It's a rejoicing day because we have our lamb. Here's my, here's my question for you. I told you before that in Luke, something was missing that is in all the other readings. What is it? Hosanna. Something that we connect in our minds with Palm Sunday, Hosanna. That's not in Luke, so we got to supply it today. And we have to say, as Jesus said, if the people don't sing, my goodness, the stones are going to have to sing. Somebody's got to sing because this is what it's all about. This is what it's all been angling toward. This is what it's all been funneling toward. Um, and Palm Sunday, Jesus goes in the gate and all the events of the coming week are going to take place. The Passover meal where we receive the Lord's Supper. Good Friday, cemetery, Saturday, and then at Easter dawn, what nobody saw coming. Uh, the cry must go up. Hosanna. Oh Lord, save us, please. Amen. <coughs> Page 41 is the Apostles' Creed, the great things that God has done for us. Pay attention when you get to the Jesus section. Please rise, page 41. <clears throat> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In our prayers today, we have a prayer concerning Judy Frank. Some of you knew Judy. Judy Frank was Joel Frank's wife. He was the district president for many years. Um, he was involved in the beginnings of Living Hope. Um, served on the mission board for years before that. Um, he was the longtime district president during my, my uh, season of being a pastor. So Judy died last week, and, and we, uh, 
we don't want to be remiss in praying for somebody who has served us mostly behind the scenes, but also um, face to face with us in our congregation's history. So we pray. Father in heaven, we uh, grieve today with someone who has lost a lifelong uh, friend, spouse, co-worker, um, encourager. Tuesday, uh, Pastor Joel will uh, bury his wife in the agricultural soil of southern Nebraska and await the resurrection. Help us to have a healthy understanding of what death is so that we aren't fools and that by some misguided idea that we don't ever talk about it, that this is somehow noble or personal or even righteous. Uh, how can anybody understand the Christian faith without understanding um, death as our, our born inheritance and life as this unbelievable, not to be expected gift from you, Father? So uh, bear Joel up, and we rejoice with Judy today. Her body is not fighting cancer anymore. Help us all have a godly word to speak to somebody who is going through this season of sadness, and pray for, point to, speak of the resurrection of Jesus as the counterpoint to the sadness of a death. Amen. Our offering would be now. Lord of all, this morning we've seen again how your fatherly heart toward us is laid bare in your son, the Passover lamb. So grant that the gifts we brought you this week may give evidence that your love is producing fruit in us, growing leading us to respond to you as the Lord of life. Amen. The uh, prayer of the church for Lent is page 125 in your hymn book. This is our last time at this also. Not just those two Palm Sunday hymns, but this is our last time to speak this prayer. 125 is a responsive prayer. Heavenly Father, you loved the world and gave your Son to liberate us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. We confess that without your love we are lost. Lord of the Church, we thank you for the treasure of the gospel by your spirit keep our eyes fixed on Jesus the author and perfecter finisher of our faith let us pray for those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule or persecution for the sake of the kingdom missionaries chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, all who pay a high price for their faith and their values as Christians. By your spirit, O oh Lord, grant them patience and endurance. Let us pray for those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick, the chronically ill, the depressed, and the lonely, those torn by conflict in personal relationships, those victimized by war and injustice, and all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Grant them peace, O Lord, and in your mercy, be their guardian and friend, their comfort and hope. Let us pray for those who care for others, pastors, counselors, physicians, nurses, social workers, caring friends, all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, 
and stand beside the dying. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petition. So think of someone, pray for our Sunday school, think of a face. Help us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Keep us faithful even to the point of death, that we may receive the crown of life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay, so we are going back to page 40. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation, and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Now our, our closing hymn is 130. This again is a hymn that's only used on this day, so let's give it all we got. Mm -hmm.